Hello booktube, welcome to Revenant Reads, I'm Ben, and today I'm filming something I'm going to be calling uh, Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is basically going to be my version of the Friday Reads or Weekend Reads or Current Reads updates that I see people posting. Um, I certainly, uh, with, with my schedule, I don't have any set day that I'm guaranteed to be able to make videos. Um, so Friday reads doesn't really make sense for me. Uh, and uh, I just kind of wanted to put my own spin on it in a certain way. Um, the the name for this uh, Fresh fresh Red Kills um, comes from a poem that I wrote a long time ago. It was kind of this, this rhyming verse about um, about actually writing a poem and, but it was kind of had this, this hunting analogy, um, and a fresh red kill. And I was playing with the idea of red. I mean, it's not, there's no literary brilliance going on here. Um, but I thought it kind of fit well with, uh, what I was going to be doing here as far as updating basically, uh, what my current reads are. Um, maybe also offer some updates on my, uh, my horror podcast. Um, you know, I, I want to thank everybody who, has subscribed so far and also the very kind comments that I was getting. Um, a lot of which pointed to the fact that, yeah, <laughs> that I was a horror fan. Uh, so I figured I should, I should make sure I, uh, at least talk about my, my podcast, which I co-host. Um, and also I want to do something else at the end of this video. And that's kind of a, a response video to, um, uh, an interview that Peg from the History Shelf posted. Uh, just yesterday, I'm, this is a Sunday uh, afternoon uh, that I'm recording this, uh, and she had posted an excellent interview with a historian that I want to kind of offer a video response to, and I'll explain that more when I get there. So first off, uh, you know, updates on reading. Um, I had shown you in the, the book haul video that I had posted last week that this is a a book on the play or the Broadway play uh, Hamilton that I'd really gotten from my wife, um, but I kind of want to take a look at it too. I'm about 100 pages into it. Uh, I don't know much about Broadway production, so I was kind of reading it for that. And also, I saw that um, Ron Chernow uh, is often quoted in this, giving his take on it. Um, you know, the, his his biography of Hamilton was a big inspiration, the main inspiration for this, and he was a histori historical consultant. Um, so I was interested to see his things. Uh, so far, I mean, um, it's it's very glowing of everybody <laughs> involved. Um, you know, it, it's as much an advertisement for the Broadway play as it is any kind of like you could almost call history of the production. And overall, I'm enjoying this so far. Um, I do expect to finish that finish this book this week. Um, another one that I read a little bit more of this past week is uh, Musashi uh, about uh, the, the famous samurai. Um, this is a book that I am actually really enjoying, but, you know, it's it's a thick hardcover. Um, it's got almost a thousand pages, very thin pages at that. Uh, it's not the most portable book for me to carry around and read, so I don't get as many opportunities to sit down and read it, um, to really spend time with it. But I am hoping that I can push through and finish this one by, um, by the end of the month, uh, which that doesn't look like a lot, but there's such thin pages, it's actually quite a bit. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's... Decent amount of text on each page. So a book that I did read and actually finish is The Sword in the Age of Chivalry by Ewer Oakshot. Uh, this was a continuation of my commitment to finally read the older uh, medieval books that were on my bookshelf that I hadn't gotten to and that had been there for way too long. Uh, this was originally written in, or published in 1964, and this is the mid-90s updated edition, uh, which Oakshot puts a lot of corrections into. Uh, and this was, yeah, you know, for, for somebody who's kind of a sword nerd, <laughs> um, I really love stuff like this. Uh, it's definitely, you know, a lot of this is outdated. Um, this is more of a reference work. Uh, but Oakshot, again, yeah, he, he does the illustrations inside this. Um, he has got some very nice, very helpful illustrations, uh, focusing on swords that are really kind of in between the Viking Age and the Renaissance. Um, going into the different parts, um, his he was working on his typology, different types of swords. And um, in addition to the illustrations, uh, there are some nice um, museum pieces, uh, plates in here. 
and especially, you know, uh, I got really kind of more seriously into swords in the 90s. Um, in a pre-internet and early internet age, there really were not many places, if you didn't have access to a museum, to see actual historical pieces of swords. Um, you know, the stuff that you see in movies in Hollywood were not at all dependable and almost never, ever accurate. Um, so uh, books like this uh, were really invaluable in that respect. Um, and I really enjoyed this. Uh, this this was definitely great. Um, you know, outdated. There are other works by Oakshot that I would recommend before this, um, especially like Records of the Medieval Sword, where he kind of finalizes his typology in a lot of ways. Uh, but um, this is something I'll talk about more in the monthly wrap-up. I'll do a more thorough uh, discussion of this. Now, um, as far as a, a TBR, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to for everything next, but I did begin today um, The Wanderer's Habemal by Jackson Crawford, uh, who is a um, Norse language and literature um, you know, scholar. Uh, he actually has a, a very prolific YouTube channel <laughs> where he talks a lot about this. And it just so happened that as I was picking this up to start reading it, um, he posted a video where he reads the Havamal in the original Old Norse. Um, which you can see there. And he's got the, the English on the other side. So after I read the English, I'll go back and I'll read along to uh, the Old Norse. Uh, yeah, I, I just started this one. Um, two others that I plan to get to after I finish Musashi. Uh, I am interested in the effect of Bushido and how it developed. Um, you know, people think of feudal Japan as being ruled by Bushido, but it doesn't seem to really be that way. It was a kind of an ever-changing thing, and it wasn't like a strict code of conduct. You could, you know, people didn't always follow it. Uh, but it really, um, beginning, I guess, the late 19th and the early 20th century, Bushido kind of became this um, retrofitted idea to create national identity. And, you know, you can see it, it does kind of affect Japan's actions in war. Um, so there's two books I'm going to be getting to very soon. And uh, the first one is um, Knights of Bushido, uh, A History of Japanese War Crimes During World War II by Lord Russell of Liverpool, who I believe was a part of both the Nuremberg and the uh, Tokyo trials. Um, so this is his account. Uh, of things that that occurred um and in kind of a companion piece to that again this is both pretty dark books but uh the rape of nanking um the forgotten holocaust of world war ii so i am looking at the negative aspects of bushido um taking a dive into that uh hopefully later on this month um now i had mentioned that uh I am a co-host of a horror movie discussion podcast called The Horrorcast. Um, and we've been doing this for quite a few years. Um, and I thought that as part of these kind of fresh red kills, I would be able to uh, offer updates. So, uh, so those people who express that they are also horror fans, if they watch my video and they want to hear more discussion on horror films, um, analysis, deep dives, also, um, you know, what kind of movies are coming out and what we think about them. You might want to check out the podcast. Um, we have recently uh, published episode 110 and 111. Um, episode 110 was our, it was me and my two other co-hosts, um, top 20 of 2020. I had seen about 130 2020 horror films. Uh, one of my co-hosts, uh, Mark, he, he, I think, saw over 700, uh, which is, it's insane. Um, but you will definitely get a good variety <laughs> within that list if you want to hear stuff about recent horror films. Um, and episode 111, we just recently uh, also released, and that was part of a series we were doing. It was um, like cold-blooded horror. It was basically horror in the snow. And we looked at 1999's Ravenous and 2015-17's um, The Black Coat's Daughter, also known as February. So if you're interested in those, you can always check out that, and I'll leave links um, in the description below to those episodes. Um, now, what I'd like to do is uh, is address that interview that Peg over at the History Bookshelf um, did with um, with Shannon Bontrager, okay, who wrote the book Death of the Edges of Empire, which I have not been able to read yet. Um, it's hardcover. It is. It's kind of more expensive hardcover. It's over fifty bucks. He does mention in the interview that a uh, 
a paperback will be coming out later on this year. Um, so when I do get to get it, uh, I will be very pleased, I'm sure. Uh, it seems like it's kind of a, a, a successor in certain ways or continuation of um, Drew Gilpin Faust's um, This Republic of Suffering, which looks at death in the Civil War, which is one of my personal favorites um, as far as Civil War history and even just kind of American history in general. Uh, it kind of looks at the the legacy of Lincoln and the um, imperialism that followed in the late 19th, early 20th century and how it relates to, I guess, the, the war dead. But um, she has an interview discussion with him uh, that lasts over an hour and they touch on some really fascinating topics, um, things that I have a keen interest in and I highly recommend that people go check this interview out. Um, it's very, very personable, uh, very uh, thought-provoking. Again, I'll leave a description inside. Oh, well, sorry, I'll leave a link inside the description. Um, but you know, it got me thinking about certain things, um, about, you know, ties between a you know, kind of the synonymous nature of militarism and patriotism in a lot of people's minds. And I wonder how much this is a product of that. Um, but one of the things they talk about, especially, is a memory historical memory, how we interact with the past, uh, the way we choose to remember things or sometimes misremember things, uh, some things that we we have forgotten, maybe we shouldn't have. Uh, and it got me thinking about some of the works that I've read on history and memory. And I went into my library and I picked out three that I think are interesting that I'm going to offer as recommendations to people who also might have an interest in this aspect, okay? The relation of historical memory and how we remember the past and the way that we actively engage with it. Um, so the three that I have uh, are very different from each other. Um, you know, it's I do want to read more widely in this area. Uh, but this is kind of where I've come from, where I started, and maybe you'll find something interesting here as well. Um, the first one I'm going to recommend is The Shoemaker and the Tea Party, um, Memory and the American Revolution by Alfred F. Young. This was published in 1999 by uh, Beacon Press. And I'll read the inside flap to so you get an idea what this is, because otherwise it's a difficult one to explain. It says, award-winning historian Alfred F. Young unearths a rich story of the American Revolution with this account of George Robert Twelves Hughes, a Boston shoemaker who took part in such key uh, events as the Boston Massacre and the Tea Party, and then served in militia, militia excuse me, as a seaman. In 1835, this common man in his 90s was discovered and became a celebrity in Boston, a guest of honor on Independence Day, and the subject of a portrait that hangs in Boston's old state house to this day. Hughes might have been lost to history if not for his longevity and the historical mood of the 1830s, in which the Tea Party of 1773, long in eclipse, was recovered. Young pieces together this extraordinary tale and adds to it poignant reflections on the historical value of oral testimony and memory, and explores key questions about a time crucial in sh the shaping of national identity. What did it mean for the Tea Party to be claimed as an American symbol by both Bostonian Brahmins uh, and the first trade unions? Here's the important one. How did the memories of ordinary people pass into history? How should their stories be recognized by keepers of the past? Young Search leads us on a, an exciting journey and offers a provocative reading of American history. Um, so, yeah, this guy, <laughs> Hughes, uh, he was... In his 90s, uh, in the 1830s, and this is also when uh, many people were uh, getting pensions for the American Revolution. And in order to get a pension, you basically had to give a, a full account of your service. And there were thousands of testimonies, basically, about what people did during the Revolution during this time. Um, and, you know, it, John Adams, um, who died in uh, 1826... Uh, he lived long enough to start seeing the things that happened in the revolution start become mythologized, idealized. Um, and this is kind of a part of that. So th this is a good, I think, introduction into the idea of history and memory colliding and maybe colluding. <laughs> uh, you know, how, how, do, how do we start kind of making a mythology of the past? How do we remember certain things? How does an event like the Tea Party end up becoming such a historical flashpoint in retrospect. 
um, to what would become the American Revolution. So I, I think a discussion of historical memory, this is a good, this is a good point to start looking at um, one of the events where it occurs in our nation's young history at that point, uh, where it starts building its own memory and mythology uh, and identity. Um, so that's my first recommendation. The next one is um, slavery in public history, uh, the tough stuff of American history. And this is from the University of North Carolina Press. And this is looking at, of course, slavery in public history. Public history being uh, museums, living history, uh, memorials as well. Um, the place where the public goes to learn history. And uh, the often contentious relationship that that has with slavery, um, with sometimes, especially the horrors being denied. Um, but this is basically a, a collection of essays that deal with it, that many of which I found incredibly fascinating. Um, we've got, uh, like, Avoiding History, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings and the Uncomfortable Public Conversation on Slavery. Um, In Search of a Usable Past, Neo-Confederates and Black Confederates. Um... Southern Comfort Levels, Race, Heritage, Tourism, and the Civil War in Richmond. Uh, so this was published in 2006, so it's not that old, but of course it is before um, so many of the Confederate statues were taken down. Uh, so this was a lead up into that uh, before we had really started confronting a lot of those things. Um, but I think there's still a lot of value in this. Um, and, you know, it relates especially to, uh, to the Civil War and its legacy. Um, so this is one that I think is very interesting. The last one goes along the lines, especially with my horror studies, um, because one of my interests in the horror genre is how it reflects everything from past anxieties, fears, and traumas. Uh, and horror has been doing that for a long time. The horror films been doing that for over a century. Um, and this is a very interesting, difficult to classify book. This is, um, Ghostly Matters. Haunting and the Sociological Imagination uh, by Avery F. Gordon. Um, and this is from University of Minnesota Press. Um, let's see, this was published, let me see. Um, I think originally in the late 90s, but then republished in 2008, which, I, which is when there was a new forward added to this. Um, and I said, it's, it's a difficult one to talk about. Um, essentially what she's doing is talking about haunting um, through both history and also she does um, literary criticism in here, uh, like Toni Morrison's Beloved, she looks at, uh, which the, the literary analysis is interesting. I don't know if it's the, the strongest evidence for really what she's doing, but really this is a conversation starter. It's not an all-encompassing theory. She's trying to get people thinking about ghosts. Um, and ghosts in the way where they are the past intruding on the present. They basically are the past not being denied by the present. Um, a haunting is when you're confronted by the past, which you thought was dormant. And that confrontation um, demands some kind of retribution, demands some kind of action from the present. Uh, and this very much sounds like um, what, in the conversation with Peg and Shannon, sounds like, um, like what they, I think we referred to as hot memory. Uh, yeah, a, a past that we are actively engaging with and trying to come to terms with, uh, a memory that um, is still is still very active uh, in our time, um, and that really is kind of what haunting is. Um, so I would like to read just a very quick passage from this. So here she says in the introduction, haunting is a frightening experience. It always registers the harm inflicted or the loss sustained by a social violence done in the past or in the present. But haunting, unlike trauma, is distinctive for producing a something to be done. Indeed, it seemed to me the haunting was precisely the domain of turmoil and trouble, that moment of however long duration, when things are not in their assigned places, when the cracks and rigging are exposed, when the people who are meant to be invisible show up without any sign of leaving, when disturbed feelings cannot be put away, when something else, something different from before, seems like it must be done. It is the socio-political, psychological state to which haunting referred. Um, and I think that there is a definite parallel between historical memory and what's going on here. Uh, there are other books I've read that deal with this, but um, this is just such a unique, interesting work uh, that 
I think relates to this whole idea. Um, so again, the three that I'm, three recommendations that I had were um, uh, The Shoemaker and the Tea Party, Slavery and Public History, and Ghostly Matters. So please, uh, you know, if, if any of that sounds interesting to you, make sure you check out uh, Peg's interview. I highly recommend it. And um, otherwise, I'll see everybody next time. All right. Thank you.